goodies to y'all. I'm fixing to bring the goodies out of 45 years of preaching to the adult class. I'm here to tell you, we'll have a good time. That's going to be great. I'm going to look at some of the studies I've done, go over them. I've already got two picked out. Remember when I first came here, I did um, something I've done about every church I've done. I uh, went over what the numbers meant and the symbols in the Bible. I've had more people ask me to do that again. So that'll be my first message Sunday night is what the numbers in the Bible mean, especially in the book of Revelation because it's full of numbers and they all have a meaning. And I, I've had more requests to do that. So I'm, that's, that's going to be the starting point. And each day I'm going to look back and I'm going to pray and I'm going to say, God, what do you want me to teach them tonight? And I'm gonna, I got folders of sermons that long. And I'll just feel through them, and I just feel like God's going to say, teach them this tonight. Teach them this tonight. And that's what I'm going to do. You go enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy doing it again. Some of it I ain't done in 40, 30 years. But I was talking to Mimi in there a while ago about it, and she said, but one thing is, it don't never change. The Bible's always going to be the Bible, whether you preached it 30 years ago, whether you preached it today. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm excited. I'm more excited. I ain't been excited about the other. I, but I, I thought I had it, but that's where it works for me sometimes. So anyway, we're going to have a good time, and I want you to come and learn. It, 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 it'll be a good time for everybody. So, uh, And then, of course, this Sunday night will be graduation service. So got a lot of things going on. I like it when it's like that. All right, I got to talk about oldies but goodies. I got an oldie but goodie I'm going to play for you tonight. I started to break out a whole brand new slate on you tonight, but then that oldie but goodie stuff got in my mind. And uh, so I'm going to pray one I probably played for you a year or so ago, by the McCainis. It says, I think the name of it is, Up in Heaven, They're Getting Ready to Crown a King. Let's play it. One. place in that home in the sky excitement is mounting as time's drawing nigh the pearly gates glisten the golden streets gleam they're getting ready in glory to crown the king when the trumpet has sounded and time is no more when the last weary pilgrim has walked through the door when that heavenly choir has gathered to sing they'll be ready in glory to crown the king lift your weary eyes homeward and tarry no more look beyond the human bondage to a bright golden shore though the night finds us so weary come morning we're gonna sing oh they're just about ready to crown the king when the trumpet has sounded and time no more when the last weary pilgrim has walked through the door when that heavenly choir has gathered to sing they'll be ready in glory to crown the king when the trumpet has sounded and time is no more when the last weary pilgrim has walked through the door when that heavenly choir has gathered to sing they'll be ready in glory to cry
they crown the king. Amen. Last line she says is, Hallelujah, I'll be there when they crown the king. If you're a child of God, you'll be there when they crown the king. I want you to catch one of the verses in that song that says, When the last one walks through the door, the heavenly choir will sing, and then they'll crown a king. The last one that ever gets saved, that ever chooses heaven. Think about that now. Somebody will be the last one to go to heaven. And then the door will be shut. And that's just a fact. And that's what she says. When the last one goes through the gate and the choir starts to sing, they'll crown the king. And it'll be over with as far as chances and opportunities. But if you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to the 19th chapter of Isaiah, which is where... We have uh, stopped that. We did the 18th chapter, but we won't go through this chapter as fast as we have the last couple. But this is a very important chapter in the Bible. This chapter here, remember he's talked about the burdens on different countries and uh, like Ethiopia and Damascus and those countries that have been the enemies of Israel and he's, all the previous chapters he's Appointed woe unto these people. Well, now he comes to one of the great nations that at that time in history that existed in the world. And that was the nation of Egypt. Egypt, like Israel, those are probably, I would dare say, the countries two most mentioned in the Bible are Egypt and Israel. One Represents what? God. As a general rule, the other one represents Satan. So this is that uh, battle from the Garden of Eden. And it gets much greater as the children of Israel are called and the nation of Israel begins. Now understand that the nation of Israel, for all of their existence, have been an up and down nation. They'd, they, they'd get two or three good kings, and but they'd worship, they'd serve God. And then the next one they'd get would be evil, and he'd bring the idol worship, and want to get worse. Then they at, later on would get one that loved God, and he'd take them back. But they, this was the history of Israel. And I'll be honest with you, they were probably more down here than they were up there with Israel. Because they joined into the world where they lived at. And this has happened. But in this time, in this chapter, when we look at this, this is a time when Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. It had scientists. It had educated people. It had armies that were the most feared armies on the earth. There was no other nation, and maybe even in history, maybe, until Egypt came along, that had the ability to do what? Build a pyramid. Well, you say that ain't nothing. Let me tell you something. The pyramids are the most amazing things that I have ever seen. They are huge. You, things you see on TV and about imagine, I am telling you those things are just drops in the bucket how huge those things are. They cover city blocks, one of them. And they were the people that figured out how to build them, the technology that they needed, and all this was done by hand and laborers and workers. And those things are built high in the air, and they're huge. The Egyptians were very smart people in this day. They, they accomplished great uh, achievements. 
And I say all that to say this. In the world that we live in today, when this was written, they were the number one nation, biggest nation, most powerful nation in the world. Now, in the times that you and I live in, and we use this term, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Israel now is not even in the top 20 of powerful nations anymore. It's just not there anymore. But, be, but one thing remember, Egypt covers much of the territory around Israel now. Much of the territory around Israel now. But my, how the mighty have fallen. But they're not the only ones. When you go through the Old Testament of the Bible and you study these countries, let me just name a few of them. And these were powerful people, powerful countries at one time. Syria. Who was a dreaded enemy of Israel? The Assyrians were. Powerful. Babylon. Who were the ones that took the, the children of Israel in captivity? The Babylonians did. Kept them there. Greece thought they would rule the world, and they did for a period of time. Then came after the Greece, the great Roman Empire. And they thought they would rule the world forever because they were probably at their time the greatest nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth. But, but, look at them now. Look at them now. Spain, France, England, Germany, for a brief period of time, they were the leading powers in the world. But this is the point I want to make to you now. None of these are leading powers in the world now. None. We live in a world, and I studied this a little bit today, and I, I've been off, I've been rambling, studying so much different stuff about drove me crazy this week. But I was looking at two weeks ahead on living in a world of chaos. And I was talking about one of the things that has brought the world to where it's at has been a globalization of all countries trying to make them one country. We want to be in a, this is what I heard 15, 20 years ago, we want to have a global economy. We want to be in with China and we want to be in with Russia and we want to be in with the European nations. We want to ever be one economy. Well, you do know that at the end of time, there's going to be one economy. At the end of time, there'll be one king, the Antichrist. But the point is this. Nobody, none of these great empires that I'm talking about tonight, was ever able to conquer the whole world and rule it forever like they thought they would. None of them. Or they ruled for a while, but then somebody come along greater than they did. They ruled for a while, and then somebody come along greater than them. They couldn't hold it. The Antichrist will be the greatest one since all of this to come and do it, but he can't hold it either. Why? Because in heaven, they're getting ready to crown a king. And when he comes, for the first time in the history of mankind, we will truly have a global economy where one man rules it, and his name will be King Jesus when he comes back to rule. And, but we, can you not see that the groundwork is being laid for everything? Now, I ain't got nothing to do. I want to talk to you tonight. I got way off. But that's what happens. I get studying too much stuff uh, with that. But when you read the Bible, you will find that probably other than Israel, the second greatest kingdom that is mentioned throughout history is the Egyptians. The Egyptians. You see, think about what the Egyptians did. In the book of Genesis, they fed the whole world. Our Sunday school lessons, remember, we just got through talking about Joseph, who went into Egypt, worked for the Egyptian Pharaoh, and they fed and conquered, and they had the whole world. Everybody had to come to them to get food. So they, at one time, 
fed the world. They're part of, his, of Israel's history like no other nation. A little later on in the history of Israel, they provided food for them, but a little later on, they would persecute them. 430-some-odd years, the Egyptians would take Israel into slavery. Just before that, they fed them. Remember when Joseph and his family and all came there, and they give them the land of Goshen, but see what happens. Things change, always change. Leadership always changes things, some for the good, some for the bad. That Pharaoh that Joseph worked for, what happened to him? He died. Next guy in, bad dude. He says, them Israelites don't be li- need to be living over there. And that they living in the high society part of town. They living in the, the plush place. We need to move them out of there. Not only do we need to move them out of there, we make, need to make slaves out of them. We need to put them into factories working. We need to put them into we need to put them in slavery. And they did put them in slavery for over 400 years. Egyptian. The good, the bad. So he was their persecutor. It was the greatest power in the world of its day. But there was still one nation that they had fear of, and it was not Israel. It was the Assyrians who were outside there. So what you happen in this is this. God declares judgment on the nation of Israel. When you see in that first verse there, what does he say? Just like he did in the previous chapters, the burden of Egypt the burden, the load, the weight of Egypt that is going to be placed on this this country that God will do to them. He says, when I bring judgment on them because of the way that they've treated my people, enslaved them, killed them, they're going to have to pay for that. That's what God said. So he says in that scripture, in the first verse, he says, The burden of Egypt, behold. Now, burden there literally means judgment. That's what it means. The judgment of Egypt. The Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. He shall come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt shall be moved or torn down or done away with when he comes at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. I like that part where it says he's going to come on cloud. That ain't the only time in the Bible it says he comes on the cloud, is it? That song, when the last one is entered and they crown the king, he comes on a cloud and he calls the church home. He doesn't come to earth. That ain't his second coming, but he steps out on the cloud. He said that this, he will ride, be like the swiftness of a cloud. He will come down there, and he shall come, and he names the place, and he doesn't mix it up. Egypt. Why? He gives the reason. The idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. I'm not sure... I'm not a smart guy, but I'm not sure that there's any nation in the Bible that is mentioned that were, that worshipped more gods and more idols than the Egyptian people did. They had gods and idols everywhere. They were a idol-worshipping people. So he says, when I come, what does he say? that the idols of Egypt will be destroyed. Again, I know y'all get tired of hearing me preaching saying this. Got to get past that first commandment. Egypt never got past it. Thou shalt have no other gods. 
They were a godless, worshiping country. God said, I hate it. They were a prideful country, and God said, I hate pride. So when you see this, you see the anger of God. And what he's really saying there when he says in that scripture uh, that I read, they shall be moved, when he comes on the cloud, it says that the idol shall be moved in his presence. You know what that really means? When they look up in the sky and they see Jesus coming, literally this is what it means. They will start trembling. He said they'll start shaking. Why? Because they know he's coming to destroy them. And fear comes in them because of this. And then he says the heart of Egypt will melt. Your heart is your life. Your heart don't work, you don't work. He says the heart of Egypt, that what keeps them going, will go away. That what gives them strength. That what gives them the ability to live. When they see Jesus coming, that heart will start in AFib. And then it eventually will die. There'll be no heart. The greatest nation that ever existed will become weak at the sight of Jesus' coming. At the sight of his coming. So, I love this verse here. These, these, he says, when this begins to happen, he says, I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. What does he say? Once the nation starts trembling, once fear comes into the nation and they don't know who's leading it, they don't know what's going to happen, what breaks out? Civil war. They start killing each other. He says the Egyptians will do what? They will be against the Egyptians and they shall... Fight everyone against his brother, his own brother, and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. Civil war. Civil war. You know, and, and this is one thing, and I'm, I'm going to go into another little bit of prophecy here. And, of course, this is just my opinion now. This ain't nothing here. If America keeps moving in the direction it's moving in, and the bitterness and the hatred between the people in this country keep getting worse than it is, don't you ever think for one second that that couldn't happen to us? The Egyptians fought the Egyptians. The governments in the city, what did they do? I'll just say the Democrats and Republicans, what they do? They fight and kill one another. That's what it's saying here. Everything civil war breaks out. Many, I, I read where one author said that um, during the Battle of Armageddon at the end time, the great battle of the end of the world, that that's what's going to happen to all these armies and nations for many of them. When they start turning on the Antichrist, they start fighting amongst themselves and killing themselves. And, that, you know, I don't know that that's true, but that's what I read. So, he says, when the Lord comes on the clouds, he'll tear down the idols. The people will be afraid of what is happening because you know why? They don't understand what's happening. This ain't been written yet. This is going to happen to them. The spirit of Egypt shall fall in the midst thereof. The spiritual. What keeps you going in your life? You have a spirit in you. We have in us, as children of God, a Holy Spirit. And that spirit of us keeps us trying to walk straight, do straight. That spirit of God teaches us that's what his job is. Have you ever heard anybody use the term 
Well, his spirit gave up. He didn't want to fight anymore. That's what it's talking about here. When the nations begin to clash with each other, those that may not be in the middle of the war will see how bad things have gotten in their world that they were raised in and lived in, and they never saw this coming. And so their spirit drops. They look at all that's going on, the death and all this stuff that's coming to them. Their spirit leaves them, and they have no hope. Their armies are being killed. Their cities are being blown up. There's no hope much for them. Their spirit is gone from them, is what the Scripture says. It shall fail in the midst there, in the midst of what? All these things I've told you about. They'll lose spirit. They'll lose spirit. And I will destroy the counsel thereof. So what he's saying that day, all the leaders, that led people in this destructive way, they'll pay a price for this. Let me tell you something. I don't care what kind of leadership position you may have in your life. It may be with a company. It might be in your house. It might be in a church. Let me tell you something. You better do it right. You better be able to stand for something and do it right. Because that's what he is talking about. And he says, in that day, Israel, and he says, their leaders that have been put them in this position, those terrible kings and all, he says in that scripture, they will fail in the midst and I will destroy the council. Who's the council? The people that made the decisions that got them where they were. Choices. For me and for everybody here, it controls your future. Your choices that you make today or not tomorrow can change your future. He said people have come in. There's a price to pay for the leadership that does not lead them, that seek to the idols and to the charmers that have familiar spirits and to the withers when they have nothing to do with God. When they put their hope in, you don't see it a lot, but I guess, say, 25, 30 years ago, there used to be a palm reader, a Sister Mary, or a Sister June, or somebody on every corner. Whatever. Come in, I can read your palm, and I can tell you what you feel. It's an idiot that believes stuff like that. Even when I didn't know Jack, I knew that wasn't true. I'm just telling who can read my palm? No. He said, but your problem is, you look to the wrong gods for your answers. You went to the soothsayers. You went to those that think they can rub a bottle and a, a genie's going to come out of it. You went and you trusted them for your counsel. Wizards and that stuff. So he says, what you will find, and this is what the world will all find one day. That every bit of that kind of stuff, because when you read it in the Bible through the book of Isaiah, and we've been through it, and you read that in there, it will all be in vain. I believe this in a world that we live in today. This is a word you and I all know. Do y'all not believe this? The president has advisors, right? And they tell him, you need to do this or you need to do that. Our senators and our congressmen, they have advisors. So this is the way we need to address this. This isn't the way that we need to do this. You better be sure who you take your advice from. You better be sure who you listen to. And not everything or anybody that says things are of God or of God or just because it's got a church sign out there don't mean it's a church. You better be careful who you listen to. You better be careful. Our problem today in the world, people will listen to anything. I 
I am amazed. Rhonda, tell them what, what we got in the mail today here at the church. Scientology. Wanting us to sign up for our training courses so that we can be taught by Scientology. Scientology is a godless religion. They don't even believe in God. Yeah, hallelujah. And they want to have, they got, listen, they got on that thing. We threw it in trash. We ought, should have burned it probably. That's demonic there. They had a list of when they were having classes. The month, the time and all, where if you wanted to learn about Scientology, they'll teach you. Now let me just ask you this. Do you think people will go to that? You better believe they will. All the idiots up there in Hollywood will. They fund that joker. That is a godless, unholy. I don't even call it a religion. I don't what it's a cult, it's what it is. And they sent a Baptist church. Something won't know if we'd be interested in taking classes. No, I'd be interested in teaching classes. But I wouldn't be interested in taking none. But see, that thing about this is this. They probably sent that thing to every church in Sumter County. Every church in South Carolina. Everywhere. False. It is definitely false. I just wonder how many people fall for that junk. Evidently they do. Or you wouldn't follow a man like Jim Jones. And because he tells you to drink Kool-Aid, you drink Kool-Aid and you poison to death and you die over yonder somewhere. Who does that? Fools, that's right. I am amazed at how gullible people are. That will listen. Brian, they'll listen to anything. All you got to do is call... Call yourself a church. That's just like being a preacher. Everybody in this room could go on the Internet, sign up, and be a licensed preacher by tomorrow and get your license. That's a fact. But if it ain't God called, if it ain't God called, and that's why you need to be careful. And that's why we're in trouble now. We got leaders that listen to the wrong people. All of them. Nobody stands for Jesus anymore. Nobody stands for the cross anymore. Easter's just a holiday. It's the greatest day the world's ever seen. But yet we don't look at it like that. I get off on these rabbit trails and it's hard for me to get back. <clears throat> So they have civil war. They start fighting with each other. Jesus comes back on the clouds. They're scared. They go to their charmers and their spirits and the wizards. Now, how many times do y'all hear me say that there are many spirits in this world and they're all evil except one of them? He says they listen to what? Their spirits. Plus, we listen to a spirit, the Holy Spirit, in this Bible here. Not spirits. Not spirits. We listen to a spirit. It's called the Holy Ghost. And the e Egyptians will I give over into the land of a cruel Lord. I'm going to allow... People to come in there to conquer you, to kill you, to take your land. That's the prophecy. He calls those that are going to be coming. He says unto them, when they come, they will be a cruel Lord to you. You think things have gotten bad, just hold on. And I'll give you this. 
God never prophesied anything in his word that you can't trust. If he says it here, you better believe it. It's going to happen. There's been nothing that Jesus has ever said or said about him in this Bible that has not been proved to be true. Therefore, I listened to a song. <laughs> Coming here today. I broke up one of my new broke out one of my new Phillips family CDs that I hadn't listened to. I'm getting it ready for Bible school. So I said, I don't listen to three of them, and I know most all of them by heart. I'm going to get a new one out and listen to it today. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Third song on our album says, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And he goes back in the Bible to all the things that Jesus done. And he said, because all that's true, I have no doubt. And when he tells me he's coming back again, I have no doubt because everything he's done before was true. Oh, it's a powerful song. That will be heard in Bible school. But anyway, let's wrap this up tonight. The Egyptians will I give over into the land of a cruel Lord. A fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. That happened in the Bible. Exactly what Isaiah said would happen to the Egyptians happened. In 671 B.C., the Assyrian army, remember, as great as Egypt was, for I believe for most of Israel's history, or a lot of it, their greatest enemy was the Assyrians. And then other companies would come in, and remember the ten northern kings, they'd try to make a treaty with them and try to get them help. But the Assyrians were probably the most cruel people in the Bible. They were godless. By, sir? Ain't no probably. These people here are the baddest people in the Bible. And so he goes to the most powerful nation in the world, and he condemns them for what they have done to Israel. And when he says, I will send a Lord that will be cruel and be mean to you, 671 B.C., before Christ, the Assyrians came in and attacked them. I don't know that I can pronounce his name, but the king of the Assyrians was a guy named King Asarhaddon. And he conquered the great nation of Israel in 671 before Christ. They say, that literally happened. Just like they said, the Syrians beat them. Come in and conquered them. Theologians and, and, and prophecy preachers of end times take that verse of Scripture there to say that that is the same thing that will happen to the Antichrist and his armies at the end of time. That this is a prophecy of Armageddon right here that the great armies of the Antichrist that he amass, amasses around Israel, that there's a king coming that will destroy them. And the Bible says that there will be so many of them killed and so many of them dead, the earth will be full of death, and it will take seven months to get all the dead bodies. Seven months. Can you imagine a world for over half a year there's just dead bodies laying everywhere? That's what he said. The buzzards will come. It'll take them seven months to eat all that mess and I guess they'll bury some of them over there wherever they are. I don't know what they do. But the world never seen a day like that. So he says to the king of that day, 
You just hang on. God's fixing to do this to you. He says in the future, God will do the same thing. Who will have the most powerful army in the world? Antichrist will. He will be the world dominator. But when King Jesus comes, he doesn't stand a chance. Not one chance does he stand. So this is a prophecy for the nation of Egypt then. Remember what I told you. Egypt in the Bible represents evil on most cases. Antichrist represents evil. And the same God will let the Syrians kill them then. And, they, and listen, after this happened, Egypt never recovers from that again. Even to this day, they never got back where they were till God sent the Assyrians in their home. God says, I'll take care of it from here. In times, uh, I don't need no weapons. I, uh, I'll take care of it. And he will. All right, that's enough of tonight. And uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, God bless you. Appreciate you watching. Pray for you that God will bless you and God will take care of you. Come back and visit us Sunday morning, 1030.